Alright guys, so we're fixing to go, we're fixing to start across the Pacific again, and before we do, I wanted to answer a few questions. Mr. Steve Hare asked, do boats uh, appreciate and do they hold their value? And the bottom line to that is probably 90% of the time they do not hold their value, and they do depreciate. Upgrades, do they hold their value? I, I don't know if they hold their value, but they will help hold the value of your boat a little longer, but once again, you know, putting lipstick on a pig is still putting lipstick on a pig. So, I hope that answers your question, Steve, and we want to thank you for watching. All right, next one up is Michael Phillips. He's asking, uh, you have reignited my dream from my 20s to buy a boat and sell to South Pacific. He's now in his late 60s. Can you still sell? Michael, yes, you can sell. Today I was just talking to some people that were 75 and 80 years old, and they're still out here selling, albeit they, you know, if you're in good shape and you're thinking about it, and, and the lady told me this this morning, she says, if they're looking at it on YouTube and they're asking the question, they're probably good to go. So. The fact that you're asking the question and you're looking into it, you're probably healthy enough to do it. You know, health is the main thing. Are you in good health and, and can you handle it? Are you strong enough to handle it? The reason uh, you don't see a lot of older people out here on videos is because they're out living their lives not making videos like we are, wasting our lives making videos. So <laughs> anyway, lots more older people out here selling than there are younger people from what I've seen. I mean, the, the 45 to, to 70, 75 year old class is the majority of people we see out here on the water. So I hope that answers your question, Michael. And once again, thanks for watching the show. Hey guys, welcome to this week's Q&A. We're out here in the middle of the Pacific doing our crossing. It's been a great crossing so far. We're gonna start this week's Q&A with Mr. Scott Hamilton. Scott asks, is there places to leave your boat so you can go work when you're in the South Pacific? There's lots of places. Tahiti has some really nice marinas in Papiete. Uh, Fiji's got some nice marinas. Uh, and there's some other marinas, I'm sure, in different places that you can go leave your boat and feel perfectly safe leaving your boat there. Scott, we want to thank you for watching and thanks for the question. Next on the question list is from Mr. Alfred Youngberg. He asked, did we ever install 1800 extra watts of solar? No, we haven't done that yet. That was going to be a bigger project when we were in Florida and I haven't got that done yet. I want to do it, but I haven't got it. He also asked, uh, what do you do about pirates and hostels and could you rig a spray diesel thing up and throw a flare at them? Well, you know, you probably could, but you might risk getting diesel on yourself and that fire spread across the water, hit diesel on the boat, and then you're in trouble. What we do to evade, evade pirates and evade things like that is... is uh we just stay away from places. If we ever did come across pirates, which we thought we did here a couple weeks ago, We evade. We, we, we can turn down wind. We can sell pretty fast on the wind and uh, we try to stay together with our buddy boats in places that are kind of nervous. So, Hey! There are children on this boat! We have had enough! <laughs> but anyway, just be careful, be on watch and, 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 and pay attention. You gotta be prepared. That's right. I'm not talking Boy Scout prepared. I mean big time prepared. Well, prepare for any kind of normal yeah, like a Caribbean guys. El Caribe, Spanish Maine, Salanda, Voodoo and Hoodoo and all kind of weird shit. Whoa! The next question is from Miss Rachel Green, and she asks from Houston. Hey Houston, I bet it's hot down there right now, or getting hot. She asks, how do you know what spare parts to bring, and, and how, how do you know to run lean and mean and, and stuff like that? Well, Rachel, that's a good question, and, and let me tell you how, how we do that. Out here on the water, almost anywhere, you can get the major parts you need for things. So, the things that are, the, you know, most of the things that break out here aren't, uh, aren't emergency things, what we call aircraft on the ground where you've got an aircraft on the ground and it's got to get back to running or you know, something like that. It's not an emergency situation. Now parts for like a water maker, that's an emergency thing and you want to carry spares for that water maker. The things like an extra electrical motor, so the pump parts, some electrical pump parts or the, the, the actual piston pump parts and the centrifugal pump parts that go with your water maker. Those are critical issues. If you uh, if you have uh, one generator on board, you want to keep extra parts for that generator. Anything that's mission critical, that you don't want to wait two or three weeks to get. You want to carry spares for that. And most of the things you can get anywhere in the world now. You can get stuff shipped to you just about anywhere. So you don't have to just load up with a whole bunch of spares. But things that are mission critical that you don't want to be waiting on, you want to carry those spares. And there's not a whole lot of that kind of stuff. It's just a few things like that, and, and, and that's the way it is. 
Rachel, once again, thanks for watching. Great question. I hope that answered your question. And we're going to move on to the next one. All right, so first question up today on the uh, Q&A is from Saltwater Hippie 73 First of all, thanks for watching. We appreciate you watching our show. And your question is, uh, and, and it's been asked many times, Keith never had any sailing experience. No, I did not have any sailing experience whatsoever. Me and Renee had never been on a sailboat except for one time for about two hours on a freshwater lake in Grapevine, Texas, where most of it was motoring. And uh, we had a captain on there. He, he took us around, and I don't know what kind of captain he was, but he was able to handle the small three-mile lake pretty good. So we, uh, no, we had zero experience. We took off sailing, and uh, I hired a captain in South Florida for about three days that took us out on the water and showed me how to deploy the sails. And then most of the other stuff I learned on YouTube, watching YouTube, and we took off. So no, we didn't have any experience at all when we took off. We learned on the go. Sailing's not that hard to learn. Knowing when and when and how to sail, when and when and where to sail is more important than knowing uh, how to sail. Should I take ASA courses on sailing? Should I hire a captain? Should I hire a teacher? Should I go to school? What should I do about learning how to sail and learning how to uh, navigate out there in the open waters? And in my mind, and this is just my opinion, weather is the most important thing you're going to need to know. You're going to need to know weather. And the reason you're going to need to know weather is because that's going to tell you the when to sail. If you don't know when to sail, you're going to get in trouble out there. So number two thing you need to know is where to sail. And that comes down to navigation. You need to be sharp on navigation, reading charts, nautical charts. All right, the next question is from Brandy, the midwife. Uh, she's from Austin, Texas. Thanks for watching, Brandy. You asked what drone do we use? We use a DJI Mavic Pro, and we also use a uh, DJI Phantom drone. And I like the Phantom better because it's got the big legs, the square legs. You can grab it on passage. And uh, that's what we use. Those, those drones work pretty good. They're pretty easy to use. And you always should carry one or two or three extra drones on board because you will lose them out here in the ocean. Something goes wrong. They glitch out. They get interference. They hit the sails. They go into the water. And so you lose them. But Brandy, once again, thanks for watching our show. And we appreciate you reaching out and asking a question. Next question up is from Joe. No, no, I put my old man glasses on. The next question up is from Joe Wynicki. Wynicki? It's not Wynicki. It's Wynicki. Joe, anyway, thanks for watching the show and thanks for sending your question. You, you said you just jumped onto a catamaran, getting rid of your monohull. When motoring, do you run one engine or two? Well, Joe, we always run one motor. You don't need to run two. You don't gain that much by running two when you're motor sailing. The only time we run two engines is when we are uh, coming into port, going through a pass, going into marinas. We run both engines. When we're sailing with beam reach, broad reach, or you know, upwind, uh, a close haul, and we're having a motor sail, we run the upwind engine because the boat wants to turn into the wind. It wants to turn up into the wind if you have any kind of weather helm. So you run that upwind engine and it counters the, the steering and it, uh, it helps you counter that steering so your autopilot's not working near as hard and you don't have as much weather vane in there, rudder to steering, uh, keeping you uh, from turning up wind. But that's a great question, and, and you save you save a lot on diesel and maintenance. I mean, very rarely do we run two engines anytime except for a few minutes when we're pulling into the marina or we're, we're anchoring or we're going through a pass. And 99.9% uh, .9 of the time, we are using one engine to motor, and we only motor at about five knots, and that's what we plan on when we're motoring, unless we've got some pretty decent wind to help us motor sail. And uh, this boat needs, we, we, we can, sail depending on the wind angle but if we have wind on the beam and the sea state's pretty decent we can sail with 10 knots 8 to 10 knots of wind on the beam and, and make five six seven knots uh, if the wind's behind us we need a lot more wind and and the ideal wind conditions for this boat is 15 to 25 knots i like 20 knots of wind i can go all day long in 20 knots of wind and um Going downwind, I like 20 to 25 knots of wind when I'm flying asymmetrical, and that's true wind speeds. That's not apparent wind speeds. Uh, so that's that's what we like for this boat. It, it it likes 20 knots of wind, and it does really good. It, you know, 15 to 20 knots of wind, we we make good time with this boat. So hope that answers your question. A little long-winded there, but another question Joe asked, I, I missed it. Was he's asking about solar panels? Do we like the solar panels we have? He's thinking about installing a thousand watts. Let me tell you something, guys and girls. If you want to have a boat that has great electrical systems and you don't have to run generators install 2,000 to 3,000 watts of solar figure out how to do that cosmetically right so it enhances the the look of your boat 
but you won't regret installing that much solar. Build a nice solar arch on the back of your boat to shade your dinghy, uh, make it blend in with your hard top, but get that solar on your boat. You will not regret that. That will be the best money you ever spent. It will pay you back in spades from diesel to maintenance to allow, you know, running your generator. You'll be able to run your AC units if you have lithium ion batteries and big inverters. That solar is, is the best dollar for dollar investment you can get. It is the best. You know, if I could put 5,000 watts of solar on this boat, I would do that. And uh, trying to figure out how to get more on it. That's that's just key to, to making your life easier out here on the water. So once again, Joe, thanks for watching and thanks for asking that second question. Hey guys, welcome to this week's edition of the Q&A. And starting off this week, we've got a question from Mr. Will Thacker. Did I miss how you came up with the name Zatara? The nearest definition that comes the closest is Zatara, Spanish for wrath. And yes, uh, well, we, one of my favorite movies, and my kids' favorite movies, is The Count of Monte Cristo. And his nickname by the pirates was Zatara. And in that movie, it meant driftwood. What is his name? His name? We should call him Zatara. Sounds fearsome. It means driftwood. <laughs> Jack came up with, hey, why don't we name it Zatara, and that's what we named it, and that's what we went with. So thanks for asking the question, and thanks for watching the show. The next question coming up is from Mr. Billy Tyree. I've been watching you guys for a while. Have you ever had a moment you thought you put your family in harm's way? Once again, Billy, thanks for the question. I uh, I have not yet felt uh, we were in danger on the high seas yet. I hadn't I hadn't felt a time yet where, we, where I didn't think we was in control or where we could get out and escape or do something like that. So... The question is, no, Billy, so far, 25, 30,000 miles of ocean passages, we haven't felt unsafe yet. And we hadn't felt like we were in danger. Uh, now, I had lots of anxiety when we first started because I didn't know what to expect. But uh, being out here as long as we have now, two or three years, it's been, uh, we hadn't come across something that really scared us. Now, that being said, Billy, if we had sailed in some of the seas, some of the biggest seas we've been in, and some of the storms we've been in, if those were the first sails out of the box that we hit, if we'd hit those kind of uh, uh, storms and those kind of seas in day week one, week two of our, our voyage, I might have been scared. But you, you, plan your route, you plan your time and you work your way up to it, and, and uh, by the time you get to some heavier seas and some heavier winds, you're used to it and you've worked your way around it. Once again, Billy, thanks for watching and we appreciate you following along. Next question coming up is from Palm Friends. This question is, maybe it is, maybe this is a dumb question, but what happens if someone falls overboard while everyone else is below the deck? Well, that's a great question. And when somebody falls overboard at night or, 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 or I throw somebody overboard, they're gone. They're just gone. We, we let them float away, like our theme song, let it float away. <laughs> uh, we don't throw out the line. We don't want to catch them back. We let them float it. No, but on a serious note, that is a serious consideration. And like on night passages and when we're at night or in bad weather, we don't let anybody out of the cockpit. You, you just don't come out here. We don't even let the little kids come out of the salon. They don't, they're not even welcome out here. They get kicked in the teeth. I, I take them down, time down. We don't want them out here because if you lose somebody at night, if somebody falls overboard, I don't care if it's calm seas or not, and you don't know they went overboard, you're going to have a hard time finding them. So you have to have some really strict rules about that and understand that that is, that is the most lethal thing that can happen is falling overboard at night or in rough seas and nobody knowing about it. Once again, Palm Friend, thanks for watching. There goes the guy with five Bond. beauties on board. Oh. The Bond girls. Okay. It's a single guy with Bond girls. It's okay. not fair. So you're... Next question on board comes from Mr. Thomas Great Batch. Tom, thanks for watching. We appreciate you watching. Your question is, do you still have a cat on board? The, qu the answer to that is yes. Does our cat sleep most of the day, Tom? And does he charge around the boat? He does sleep a lot during the day and the night, and he does charge around the boat, and we don't confine him. He confines himself in rough seas. I think he gets a little seasick, and uh, he'll go lay down, and he'll puke and diarrhea on, down there by his hold, and he throw up and crap and pee all over the place. But once we're uh, off a of passage, he goes right back to his toilet bowl and he gets up there and he takes his does his business and he presses a flush button and, and, and what's good is I've taught him to press the electronic flush button so he goes meow, meow, and it's out so it's very good but uh, yeah we love having a cat on board Zuko's a good key cat and he's right over there watching me making sure I represent him right and uh, 
he, he, he really changed the dynamic. I'd recommend having a cat on a boat. It's, it's fun. It's, he's, just a, he's just a good kid. Another question about cats is, is how hard is it to sell with animals out here? And it is tough. That logistically, moving cats into countries that have tough quarantine laws and moving animals, it's expensive and it's, it's, it's uh, paperwork consuming and it's stressful. And knowing the rules and the laws and what you got to spend and all that kind of stuff. Especially like countries like New Zealand and Australia, they have really, really strict quarantine laws and they're expensive quarantine laws. And, and there's nothing wrong with those. You just need to know up front what that is before you bring a cat on board and you plan on going in and out of those countries to make sure you have money to take care of business when that time comes. So once again, Thomas, thanks for watching and thanks for your comment and we appreciate all your support. The next question comes from Mrs. Uh, Paige Statham. How do you deal with crossing time zones constantly? Do all your clocks sync and do and do it automatically, or do you have to change the time? Also, how does it affect, say, night shifts, for example? Well, that is a great question, Paige, and we appreciate you watching the show. So GMT time in England, which is where the zero degree starts, every 15 degrees going west, you lose an hour. So when you get to 15 degrees west, you've lost an hour. When you get to the next 15 degrees, you've lost another hour. And so every time we go across those, those uh, 15 degree marks, we'll move the clocks back. Our clocks don't do it automatically because we don't have cell signal. A lot of clocks or a lot of cell phones and stuff need a cell signal to adjust automatically. We do them manually and that's how we do it on our chart plotters and everything else. In this particular time that I'm making this video, we just crossed the international uh, dateline, which means we moved 24 hours forward. So where it was Tuesday morning, it's now the same time on Wednesday morning. And now we are on the other side of the Greenwich Mean Time and we're working still subtracting an hour for every 15 degrees but it's just working the other direction once again thanks for watching our show hey guys welcome to this week's q a first of all i want to talk about that you just watched a video on chores what our kids do on the boat we get a lot of questions about that and what they do and how we discipline the children and basically discipline on this boat is if you don't do what you're told the first time and with a good attitude and you do a good job on it you get to go polish stainless steel so Everybody, we have a chore law, we have a chore chart, and everybody does their chores, and if their chores, if we've got to ask them to do their chores, they get to go polish stainless steel, or they get to clean bilges. So having four slaves on the boat is excellent, because I can, I love when the boat looks shiny and new, and the more they get in trouble, the more shiny and new my boat looks. So once again, slave labor, we like it, and we want more of it, and we like it when our children get in trouble, because we just stick them out there with the stainless steel brush, or kit and they go to polish and stainless steel or cleaning the bilges. Bilges are really fun especially when they're nasty and grimy down in there. Those are excellent opportunities for your children to learn character and integrity growth. So once again we don't have to remind our children anymore to do chores. They're pretty jumping to that. So now we're going to get right into this week's Q&A session. Mr. Glenn Holden has asked, I notice you use VHF, uranium and cell phones a lot. Do you have HF SSB on your boat? All right, Glenn, that's a good question. We get asked that a lot, and we don't have an SSB on the boat. Number one reason we don't have an SSB on the boat is because most people out here on the water now use Uridium GOES, and we use the standard VHF when we're in close quarters within uh, line of sight six, seven miles. But uh, the SSB is, is an art form. You really got to know how to tune those things in and work on those. There's still people out who have those, but it's just so much easier. You can get all your weather, you can get all your stuff on Uridium Go. Now we carry backup Uridium Goes, so we have two on the boat in case one goes down because that's a piece of equipment you don't want to fail on you. But uh, that's a great question. Once again, there's nothing wrong with SSB. Sometimes I wish I had it, but it'd just be another thing for me to have to learn how and, and use. And if you're not good at those and you spend a lot of time with them, they're hard, you know, it's, it's an art form to, to, to do high frequency and SSB type stuff. And so uh, most cruisers out here now use the Uridium Goes. Once again, thanks for the question. Moving right along. Next one comes from Evan Flack. Uh, Keith, early on you mentioned nervous about the Volvo engines. What do you think of them now and what have you, now that you've had them all? Well, that's a great question. So far, the, the Volvos have been good engines. We've had a little, the issues we've had with them haven't been major issues. Uh, we thought we had a turbo. You all saw that in a week or two ago video and, and it turned out not to be a turbo. It just turned out to be a hole in a hose. But, uh, you know, these engines have about 3,000 hours on them, I think, by now. And uh, they seem to be good engines. They, they, they doesn't seem to be anything wrong. They seem pretty simple to work on. I like changing the oil on them for the simple fact that the oil uh, filter is vertical, and you undo the top and you pull out the filter. And so you don't get oil everywhere by taking a side screw oil filter off. That's one bonus about those engines. The negative about these engines on this boat, and it wouldn't matter whether they were Yanmars or Volvos, is they are down in those engine holds and you can see 
how hard it is for me to get down in there. But so far the Volvo engines have been good. I've been thinking about repowering the boat with some newer engines before we go on the next season, but uh, uh, we haven't got to that point where I want to spend that kind of money yet. But uh, I like having the, you know, I'm not real big on a fancy looking boat and clean, crisp, all fancy and beautiful looking. I, I'm more concerned about how the, the heartbeat of that boat works and having good engines and good components inside. A lot of people get hung up on the outside of a boat and how it looks image wise. I don't. I like how it works on the inside. So uh, that's very important to me. Uh, but great question, Evan. So far, the Volvos have done well. The next question is from Mr. Chris Stevens. Chris, you've got a great question here. Have we ever addressed what they do when the women are on the rag at sea? Well, I tell you, on land we had what we call a menstrual shack, and we put those girls out there for a week until that whole program was over with. Out here we have the menstrual dinghy. We slap them in the back of the dinghy, we tow them behind the boat for a week, we throw them some water and some scraps when we're ready, and then they, they, they get over their time pretty quick. You know, and, and if there's any PMS to go along with it, a little foul attitude, they get right in the dinghy immediately. So they can either be out there for two weeks or one week. It just depends on their attitudes. But great question. No, really, in all seriousness, guys, I know you guys are thinking I'm sexist right now, making fun of that. I'm not. I love my wife and my daughters. We do make fun of ourselves. And my fat, I know a lot of people were a little iffed about the last thing where I was making fun of women. I'm fat, bald, and, and hairy on my back, so get over it. I make fun of myself as much as I make fun of anybody. Being on the rag at sea is no different than being on the rag on land. The girls take care of their stuff. They have their feminine products. Uh, sometimes they use Diva Cups. Sometimes they use just an old rag that we have laying around that's not clean. That's the Q&A for this week, and I want to give a very special shout out to Alexander Rose Richardson. We know you've been going through some hard times with the chemo treatments and you're, you're struggling and we just hope that you're feeling better and our prayers and thoughts are with you and I, and we hope that you're having a wonderful, wonderful day. So, Hey guys, welcome to this week's Q&A. Q&A, question and answer, Ooh. answer and question. Wow, that great. Yeah, thank you. Okay, me and Jack have taken over this week's Q&A because our father is dead. <laughs> I'm kidding. He has come down with an ailment, which we might have to take him to a doctor for the next time we get to a big place. No. All right, on to the questions. On okay. to the questions. Questions. Random Stuff asked, what happens if the night shift guy or gal falls asleep? Do we have any safeguards against that? No, we die. We die. If somebody falls asleep, they usually sleep till the other person gets up on shift. That's not Hopefully. necessarily true. Well, dad always gets up at like six. Always so you always fall asleep till the end of your shift? What, what? I did that twice. Twice? It was on the old boat too. Twice. We could have died. I fall asleep for like five minutes. But that's if I'm really tired. We don't really have safeguards like we should. Recently we would try like setting our alarm for like our phone alarm for when we're supposed to wake up for our shift. That way like if I fell off ten minutes into my shift the max that I can be out there floating dying is three hours until Jack's alarm wakes him up. He comes out here, he's like, oh, my sister's gone. Let's go get her. Let's go help. Yeah. But honestly, three hours, you're probably already dead. When you're out in the middle of nowhere, falling asleep probably it's isn't a big deal. deal. But Unless you know, storms. yeah, you know not to fall asleep when you're with other boat traffic or if, like you've, if, you're if you've seen the radar and there's weather. Somebody asked too, if you're a solo sailor, mm. how do you do night shifts? Well, I imagine if you're a solo sailor doing night shifts, like you probably wouldn't do it if you have a spinnaker or some other light wind sail out. But like if you've just got a main or like some, if you've got steady weather or you're, even if you're just motoring, you can probably go to sleep for your shift. I heard about this thing you can do if you like, if you sleep for 20 minutes every, I don't know, three hours or hour, two hours or something, if you sleep 20 minutes every some Is amount this of hours, yes, then once you get like past a month of doing that, you'll only have to sleep 20 minutes and you'll be awake as though you're in the day and you can be awake at night too. That's sleep 20 minutes. I'm not doing that. Thanks, random stuff, for watching our videos and sending in your question. Our next question is from Jack AIT on Instagram. Sorry, your cat's behind you looking at balls. Nice! <laughs> Get Stop. out of here! Stop! How often do you lose things overboard and what is the most valuable thing you've lost? We don't often lose stuff. Like, I think the most valuable thing we've lost was a handheld radio. It's like brand new too and it wasn't even overboard. Dad was in the dinghy and it just like slipped out of his hand when he was climbing off because he didn't like have it in a bag. We never got that back. We've lost a lot of clothespins. 
<laughs> Sales come flat. A lot of clothespins. I think we lost an oar at one point, like a kayak. Oh, yeah, oar. we had in the old boat. We, we got it back it. though. Mom dropped her GoPro while we were crossing the Bahama Bank. She like she was leaning off the sugar scoop because it was like so shallow. It was what like <sighs> ten feet of water going across the entire Bahama Bank. No, it wasn't. It was not even that much. It was like whatever. Six it, was, feet. it was really. I could stand up. In it was place. really shallow. Is what it was. And we're just motoring along, and her GoPro falls off its stick. And Dad's like, go after it! So she goes in and gets it! So I'm trying to film the boat as it glides through the water, and all of a sudden, the GoPro snaps off the stick and falls gracefully into the water. After yelling, camera overboard, I jump in to try to save it or to at least mark it. This is the first time I've ever dropped a camera in the water. And so luckily, it was shallow, so we were able to rescue the camera. Within about three minutes, Keith has the boat turned around and Finn spots the camera from the bow. Jack jumps in with a mask to rescue my camera as it waits patiently in about six feet of water. Yeah. Like if we had been in any deeper water, it would have been gone, but we got it back. Thanks, Jack AIT, Not for sure how you pronounce your that. question. No! Just hold it in the middle. The camera can't see the phone anymore. Fine, whatever. We want to give a special shout out to the Epsilon Beta Chapter of Pi Kappa Phi at Grand Valley State University. Thanks for watching our videos, guys. Stay tuned next Thursday for our latest video. See you guys out on the water. I love Lily. I miss her.